So I'm going to be giving an overview of a process which we undertook as part of Oxfam's Empower Youth for Work programme, implementing a diagnostic tool looking at social norms in the economy in Bangladesh, which is one of the country programmes. So I'll start by giving a brief overview of the Empower Youth for Work programme. So it's taking place over five years and started last year, and it's being implemented in four countries. So Ethiopia, Indonesia, Pakistan and Bangladesh, which is where we focused this diagnostic tool. And the uh, main objective of, this, of the programme is about working with young people aged 15 to 24 in rural and climate change affected areas um, on their improved economic and social empowerment with a real focus on young people as active citizens being able to influence decision making and a youth led approach. And across the four countries, we're going to be working with 176,000 young people and in Bangladesh, it will be 67,000. So this is the programme framework which underpins Empower Youth for Work and as you can see there are three key pillars and the first is around um, improving young people's agency and skills, the second is around developing economic opportunities for young people and the third which is most relevant to this piece is about building an enabling environment um, and this is where we really saw um, the interest in social norms in the economy coming out and especially that the role that young people can play as active citizens in um, building awareness raising, in influencing decision makers um, at the government level around laws and policies and interacting with a variety of different stakeholders. So as the previous slide showed, there were three areas of social norms in the economy which we really pulled out um, to work on in this programme. So the first is around um, unpaid care and paid and productive work. The second is around violence against women and girls. And the third is around early marriage and early pregnancy. Um, and as Anam said in her presentation, um, looking at social norms related to Borg and relating to sexual and reproductive health rights is quite um, a well-established um, area of work in the development field. But looking at how those norms relate to social norms in the economy is less well-developed, and that's where we wanted to focus. So the Empower Youth for Work programme has already conducted a quantitative baseline survey which looks at some of these norms. So this one day diagnostic tool was really a chance to dig a bit deeper. So we undertook um, two one day exercises with groups of about 10 to 15 young people and other stakeholders important in their lives. So people like teachers, parents, um, local religious and community leaders. Um, and what we wanted to do first of all was identify and measure social norms which were impacting on young people's and especially young women's participation in the economy. But we also wanted to go beyond that and looking at how this tool could be an entry point to developing strategies to engage with social norms. And so um, while it's a relatively small intervention, we hope to be able to roll it out to the other three Empower Youth for Work countries and then also see how that might inform our strategies um, around policy change, around just awareness raising. So this is really a starting point to being able to shift social norms at scale. So moving on to the methodology. So I'm going to go um, over the structure of the diagnostic tool which we developed. So we split the diagnostic tool into three parts and we used um, some of the key principles which Anam outlined in her presentation. So the first activity was around um, giving an the participants an introduction to social norms and then looking at what different influences on social norms might be as well as how social norms change in different contexts. And then the second activity looked at both gender norms and economic norms relating to unpaid care and paid and productive work. And then the third activity was around identifying gender norms relating to violence against women and girls and to early marriage and pregnancy. So I'll go into each activity in a bit more detail now before passing on to Pushpita who's going to give an overview of some of the findings. So um, this pulls on some of the tools and techniques which Anam gave an overview of in her presentation. Um, so we had an exercise on what makes a good woman and a good man, um, and exploring sayings around um, what good women and men do or what they're like. And that led into a discussion on how women and men should behave. So um, 
referring back to Anand's presentation, this is about looking at injunctive norms, so uh, what people think they should do rather than what people think they do. And then we also wanted to focus on what the community or peers would say. Um, and again, referring back to Anand's presentation, this was about reducing social desirability ability bias, so that, um, so that we were referring to what other people thought rather than what they themselves thought. So um, the second part of this activity um, was an introduction to social norms and um, developing some exercises with act which acted as groundwork for developing strategies for change. So first an exercise on how social norms in their context had changed in the last few years to introduce the idea that social norms can change and that they do change. And then second, a mapping exercise on influence of social norms. So these are the reference groups which Anna was talking about. So people like peers, parents, teachers, um, religious leaders or sort of more national figures like celebrities. But then also looking at things like laws or policies, um, schools, training, evidence and information or the media. So the second uh, activity looked at unpaid care and productive work. So first looking at economic norms about how people perceived unpaid care and paid and productive work to be skilled or valued. So first participants were asked to rank unpaid care and paid and productive work um, according to whether it was skilled or valued. And then there was a comparison of those tasks which were seen as most skilled or valued and least skilled or valued with those tasks which were normally done by women or by men. And then we explored the advantages and disadvantages of reconsidering what the skill or value of those activities might be. Um, and this was introducing the concept of shifting those social norms. And then the second part of this activity was looking at gender norms relating to unpaid care and paid and productive work. So looking at what the norms were around gender roles. Uh, and this was really focusing on developing strategies for change. So uh, the first part was around exploring barriers to women doing what was perceived as men's work, so often paid and productive work, and um, barriers to men doing what was seen as women's work, so often um, unpaid care work. Uh, and then we moved on to doing a ranking exercise of the feasibility of men doing unpaid care tasks or productive tasks that were traditionally seen as um, women's tasks and then of women doing paid and productive tasks which were seen as men's work. Um, and this was about looking at identifying which tasks would be easiest to shift gen norms about gender roles around. And then finally um, there was an exercise around brainstorming int interventions based on uh, effective influences and drivers of change. So the third and final activity looked into gender norms around violence against women and girls and on uh, early marriage uh, and pregnancy. So we started off with a statement um, which we presented to participants and this is the example that we used um, with the violence against women and girls group but we split the group in two and the other looked at early marriage and pregnancy. So we said taking into account the experiences of this community to what extent have local women been hit or beaten in their households over the past year? And then participants were asked to anonymously rate um, to the extent to which they agreed with the statement. So from almost never happens here to frequently happens here. So this was done anonymously and then the different range of responses was presented back to, um, to the participants. And um, this was a way of focusing on the experiences of the community, not the individual. So again, distinguishing between norms and personal beliefs. Uh, and then we had um, an anonymous mapping of participants' perspectives, again, to reduce um, the chance of social desirability bias. And then we wanted to have this question on descriptive norms, so what people think people do as an entry point into a discussion on injunctive norms, so what people think people think they should do. So the final part of this exercise was moving into the discussion. So the discussion around gender norms relating to violence against women and girls had discussion questions exploring two areas. So first about um, the the censure um, that might happen when people transgress gender norms. And this is what Anna was talking about as well. So um, this might be transgression of gender norms relating to unpaid care. So for example, um, if a woman burns the dinner or comes back late from collecting water. 
Um, but then also transgression of gender norms relating to um, women's involvement in paid and productive work. Um, so if they might experience violence after having increased mobility or increased income as a result of economic participation. But then the second part looked at fear of violence against women um, as a result of, of gender norms, where um, women might be um, afraid to um, start being involved in paid work because it would mean um, experiencing harassment or violence in the workplace or on their way to work. So these are the discussion questions which explore gender, gender norms relating to early marriage and early pregnancy. Um, so first, we looked at the injunctive norms or the expectations uh, in, in the community which existed um, around young men and young women marrying and having children. But then the second part was looking um, at the impacts of early marriage and early pregnancy on young people's economic participation. So this was both how women are limited in their economic participation by marrying early or by having children early, but then also how norms relating um, to how working women are seen, so working women being seen as undesirable or being unfeminine, um, might impact on um, young people's economic participation. So I'm going to hand over to Fishbeater now, and she's going to give an overview of the findings. Thank you, Imogen. Um, Thank you, uh, everyone. I'm Pushpita, and I'll be sharing the findings from the testing of the social norms diagnostic tool that uh, Imogen has given an overview about. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to give an overview of uh, how we did it. Like it was a two-day workshop in two places where we are having the uh, employee. We're implementing the employee for work project in Bangladesh. And we had around, as Imogen mentioned, 10 to 15 participants from different social and economic backgrounds during the workshops. And uh, we tested the tool over uh, at each place over an entire day. And the findings that I'll be sharing now are actually not the comprehensive findings, but rather the key findings, basically, so that you get an idea of what we actually can get from this tool that we're planning to expand to using in other countries. What was the most common uh, perception about unpaid and paid uh, productive work that we found that came up through our you know, discussions with that? The perception is care work is much more easier, it's very less physically demanding. So, it, and it was actually something that was agreed by both men and women. Even women themselves feel that care work is less physically demanding, it's easier than women's work, which is seen to uh, than men's work, which is seen as more difficult, requiring more skill and more energy. So, the examples that they gave is, you know, it doesn't take much effort to cook your food, or it doesn't take much effort to make the bed. Whereas it takes a lot of effort, a lot of physical effort to uh, drive a bus or draw, you know, cut the crops and you know work in the field all day long. And uh, men's work is also seen to have, seem to be making more uh, the largest contribution to the household, community, and country because uh, it's more visible and it has a uh, bigger financial contribution. It, it brings in money, so it's more valuable. That was the most common perception. We ask our participants that what actually prevents women from giving care work to men and what actually prevents men from doing care work. And uh, the most common answer that we received is that this is how things are always done. Mm -hmm. Like if I had a penny, but every time this place came up during our discussions that this is how things are always done. This is how uh, we have seen our uh, families do it. This is how we see our uh, uh, neighbors do it. This is what we read in books. This is what we see in TV. So this is the norm. This is what we see of being there. like we try to go beyond like why is this the no no why is this the you know how why is this always has to be like this and they're like it was like we were asking the strange question like are you from outside of this country or something like why are you asking this because you know that this is how it is always done that's that's the complete you know, range of answers and then uh the other opinion that came up is that women are instinctively more caring and inherently better at housework 
The interesting point to note here is that it was women who made this point more than men themselves. That women are more maternal, they're more caring, they're more soft, and they're also very much better at doing the housework. So it's like the women themselves are saying, like, okay, I don't want my husband to feed my child because my child will probably go hungry because, you know, uh, the father is not good at feeding him. So, and, uh, and when it came to being inherently better at housework, it's like, it's better for me to cook the meal than cleaning up after my husband who has tried to you know, experiment in the kitchen once and, you know, make a mess of it. So I'd rather do it myself. So, and the thing is that in Bangladesh, uh, children, women are engaged in housework or in care work from such an early age, like almost from the age of four or five, that they actually become so good at it, so naturally at it, that both men and women tend to forget that these are not acquired skills. Uh, these are acquired skills, not inherent skills. So by the time they're old enough to, you know, think about these things, it's, it appears to them like, women are always doing it. It's like they forget that they were taught this by their mothers or by their, you know, female relatives. You know, they were accompanied by the, uh, they accompanied their mother in caring for the children or the siblings to uh, cook in the, you know, to cook, uh, support their mother in cooking and everything. So this become, you know, lost. This gets lost in their mind after a time. And also, as I mentioned earlier, that women, uh, there are, there's also a feeling that women and men are not physically equipped to do each other's work. Like, women are more delicate, they have delicate fingers, they can do, you know, delicate needle point work, but men with the clumsy fingers and less patience, they cannot do needle point and, you know, make good desserts that, you know, requires, you know, a lot of intricate work. And, of course, there is the uh, social stigma related to men doing their work, the men say that they feel emasculated when they have to do women's work. It's like uh, other people, they ridicule them. It's, uh, they feel it's humiliating when they do women's care work. Then we ask what, uh, what prevents women from you know, taking on more productive work outside home. And the most common answer was that is the fear of violence, that the minute the woman starts stepping out of their homes and you know uh, start working outside the fear of uh, you know the fear the threat of violence becoming a victim to violence increases many fold it's like suddenly the threat becomes much more visible the there is threat of violence at the workplace on the way to the workplace but when they're coming back from workplace and it's quite related to what Imogen was saying earlier that it's related to the transgression of the gender rules because when you're going out when you're stepping out of your perceived gender roles, uh, men see it as a threat to their own uh, power relations. They think that you know, a woman who's coming out of their home are easy prey. they're not women of good character, so it's okay to house them, to okay to assault them. Then there's also the concern about violence and harassment in markets. Like, uh, why cannot women you know, be in the marketplace? It's like, they said that, for example, the, the uh, opinion that came up that men in markets swear a lot and sometimes fight. I don't want my wife swearing and being so on it. So if you have if you have to uh, be in a market, you know you have to be aggressive. You have to be dominant and you know uh, do a lot of swearing and everything that goes on in the market. And for a woman to do that is very unfeminine. There's also the suggestion that uh, if woman needs to be in the market, it has to be woman only marketplaces. Then there is the consideration of early marriage and pregnancy that women uh, take into consideration when you know uh, taking decisions about productive work. This is a very interesting finding. It's like uh, women feel that uh, men feel that women who are more assertive, who goes out more uh, work outside, they become sluggish and undesirable. They like they they lose their femininity because. They bargain, they negotiate, they talk loudly, they you know, make decisions, so they're like, you know, very this mannish and this is very undesirable quality. And women who work in the fields also reduce their marriage prospects because uh, traditional definition of uh, beauty is like being fair skinned and delicate and you know having this nice, you know, uh, figure and everything. But working in the fields gives you muscles, it makes you tanned and thus reduces your Managed prospects. 
And also, it's difficult for married women or with ch uh, married women with children to work outside because, for, like I mentioned earlier, that women are seen as the best caregivers. And if they go out to work, uh, the idea is that the children and the family will suffer. But uh, our way of hope, now so like everything is not very late, our way of hope is that men do sometimes do care work, but they do it especially before marriage. So, the interesting thing that we notice is that men actually do all of the care work that women do, like you know, washing clothes, making food and everything before marriage if they're living alone or if they do a living in dormitories. But things suddenly change when they get married. It's like from one day to another, they suddenly forget how to do everything else. But they do like from like on Tuesday, they're single. They know how to cook. They have know how to do the dishes, and they have know how to wash clothes. On Wednesday, they get married, and suddenly they forget how to do all this work. So we ask why, and it's like that's why we're getting married because you know <laughs> that's, that's what the wife is for. But we do agree that they do have some, you know, uh, the capacity they have. The you know. They can do, they recognize that they are able to do each other's work. It's not like we ask that, do you really, are there any special gender skills that are required to do each other's work? And, you know, they have to agree that no, there are no special skills required. They each actually do each other's work. It's just that they need to think about doing it uh, in relation to family life, not when they're only single or when they have to do it. Right. Done. So, our <laughs> so we have a uh, like uh, we have uh, entry point to shifting social norms. Like uh, there's this circular logic that you know men do women's work and women uh, sorry men work outside so they can't work at home and women work at home so they can't work outside. So this is somewhere that we need to you know this is a logical circular thing that we need to work on breaking. The interesting part is that. Uh, the younger community members are more willing to break the circular logic than the older community members because uh, yeah, for older people, these are actually norms, but for younger people, it's more like social norms. Like they do it because they see other people do it, but they are more willing to change than the older people. Lastly, these are some of the you know, ways that they have suggested that we can break this circular logic, break and change the social norms. We can, uh, you know, uh, engage with the government so that uh, violence against women and girls is reduced in public places, so that uh, the threat for women going outside to work is reduced. There are care centers for children and disabled people, so that the early marriage is prevented. And uh, media, so they want the media to take up the issue of uh, changing the curriculum so that both girls and boys can do uh, so that things like uh, care work, paid work, all these things, like the gendered roles are, you know, uh, the alternative gendered roles are presented in the curriculum.